my last talk. Um, but uh, there are a couple things that I think can be useful. When I first uh, came up with this uh, idea, <coughs> the question was, well, is this going to be relevant to, to the, the junior residents? Because the senior residents are the ones thinking about negotiation. And uh, I think it will be. I think it will be relevant. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're going to un understand negotiation styles. We're going to know when to use various styles. There are two major categories. Um, <laughs> We're going to review some processes. I'll give you some tips and tricks. Um, so this is the definition of negotiation. Right? So the idea is that everyone wants a beneficial outcome. You want to uh, resolve points of uh, difference. And you want to gain advantage for yourself or for your collective. So are you guys negotiators? Do you negotiate? Who here negotiates? <laughs> Every single person here negotiates. You negotiate with consultants. You negotiate with for admissions with the with the medical admitting resident. You negotiate um, with scheduled trades. You know. Uh, you negotiate with your significant others. Right? I came. My wife's in New York City. I came to Slapbush. She went to Connecticut. So that was a negotiation. Right? Why is she not coming here? Your personal business you negotiate all the time. And then many, many things you buy. Some things the price is the price, other things, um, you know, the price is not necessarily the price at all. So critical questions for starting any negotiation. <laughs> is the future relationship with the other party important? So when would it be important? Somebody over here. Significant other, okay, yes, yes, mostly, usually, usually gonna be important. When is it not gonna be important? Single interaction. Single interaction, like buying a car. I'm taking care of the car salesman thinks me after this point. I'm hoping to sort of uh, uh, have him over a barrel and get the car for the cheapest uh, price. Is the reputation I create from this particular negotiation going to affect future negotiations? When does that when does that come into effect? What's that? Surgical residence, okay. So you can't be completely hard on surgical residence. What about schedule trades? Like there was a, there was some there was a resident there was a resident when I was here that if you wanted this person to trade, he would make you trade two for one. <laughs> two for one. So he would do one night shift and, and you know your one night shift and you would have to two of his night shifts, right? That's sort of a hardball you know, reputation. That, that reputation affected future negotiations. I never went back to him, right, after, you know, after he had me over the barrel one time for future help. So if either answer is yes to these questions, then you need a collaborative bargaining win-win strategy. And this is not something that we do a lot of, and we're gonna talk a lot about that today. This is the strategy you need to be using because we often use a positional strategy and not a principled strategy when we negotiate. And we really need to be using a, a, a principled strategy or collaborative strategy. So if either answer is yes, you need a collaborative approach. The answer to both questions is no, you can go to town, right? You can abuse this person. <laughs> use competitive bargaining, which is win-lose. That's often what we use when buying a house or a car. Uh, or something else. So, who can you get negotiate with? I think it's critically important that you understand the scope uh, of those you might be negotiating with. Right? Who are the people you might be negotiating with? And this truly can be anyone. In understanding the needs <coughs> that they have, right? what are the needs of the people you're negotiating with? And this will be critical to understanding uh, how to get through this. And then negotiation within the hospital usually requires a collaborative approach, right? Because you have a preservation of the relationship. So I keep talking about these two different types. These are basically lined out for you here. So principle, which is an art and a science, there's usually a fair conclusion, that's what you're hoping for. It maintains the relationships. Um, hard won't dominate. So 
you know, if, if I'm a hard negotiator and somebody is not really trained in negotiation, if we get into a win-lose style, we get into a positional negotiation, I, I'll, I'll kill them, right? Because, because they're not, I mean, I, I can dominate them, but with collaborative negotiation, that won't happen. It's pretty efficient, and power positions mitigated, right? You, as, as a resident, and me, as the program director, or the vice chair, or the chairman, we can still negotiate on things, uh, and it doesn't matter that there's a power differential. As opposed to positional negotiation, it's an art, it's a, you know, you usually wind up in a middle ground between two extreme positions. I say I want to sell for 10,000, you say I'm not paying more than 300, right? So we wind up in this middle ground between these two extreme positions. I didn't really expect to get 10,000 for it, and you didn't ever believe you were only gonna pay 300, right? So we wind up in this middle ground where neither one of us is happy. You can have soft techniques, you can have hard techniques with this. Uh, it's inefficient and it can certainly damage relationships. So I'll tell you a little bit about my father. I, you know, if you're residents here, you've probably heard stories about him, but this, what I call the big man, this is the big man right here. He's sitting down, but dad's about six, seven. I'm the smallest man in my family, they all call me runt. That's true. <laughs> um, so I said, this is back when I was living at home. I said, dad, I'll be home by midnight. And he said, make that 11. And I said, eh, how about 11.30? And he said, eh, how about 10.30? And I said, all right, all right. Okay, dad, fine, fine, 11. He said, no, the offer's presently 10.30, dropping fast. Do you want to take it? Or do you want to you want to keep negotiating? <laughs> so what's the problem here? I have no power. Right? <laughs> I have no power in this negotiation. And I'm using a positional approach. Right? This is why I failed. I actually had to be in by 10 o'clock because I kept talking. <laughs> I should have just grabbed my keys and walked out. So negotiation basics. Banta is an important concept. This is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Right? What are you going to do if you can't come to agreement on this particular topic? What's your alternative? What's your reservation point? Right? And this is often like, you know, I'm the reservation point for a house. Like, I'm, I can't sell it for less than this. Right? I owe this amount of money on it. I have to pay this amount of commission. So I can't sell it for less than this. Um, so that's your reservation point. <coughs> is the negotiation competitive, collaborative, or mixed motive? So competitive, buying a car, selling a house. Collaborative, you want to work together um, to get a patient admitted. Right? Or is mixed motive, something in between. Um, and what's your target point? Your target point, or what you're hoping to get out of this, is not necessarily what you ask for, right? You should be, you should be optimistic, especially when you're doing positional bargaining. So, so I don't, I don't, I think I'd like to get two thousand dollars for this, you know, for this car. I'm going to ask for twenty five hundred. Right? So my target point uh, is high, and it's certainly not the, the reserve. Look at principal negotiation. So understand the scope of your influence and control. What are you negotiating for? What control do you have over this process? And what are you negotiating for? What do you really want? So this is principal negotiation preparation. Next, understand who you're negotiating with. Who are they? What's their scope of influence and control? Do they have control as well? Can they give you what you want? Are you negotiating with them, but they really don't have the, the ability to give you what you need? And know your banter. Know your best alternative to negotiate agreement. What, you know, what point are you just gonna walk away because this is not as good as, as, as your reservation point? And then start the negotiation. Let's talk about your position. Your position can be total control, can be partial control with high influence, and this actually may be where a lot of you are for admissions or something like that. It could be partial control with low influence. Right? So maybe a junior resident trying to get a patient admitted. It could be no control, no influence. Right? And you still need to negotiate. We'll talk about these different things. So let's practice. You're the PGY3 in pot A. They still call it pot A? Okay. A uh, 47-year-old female presents emergency department with AFib, fever, Obstructive uh, urolithiasis and a UTI. The AFib is old, but now her rate's 130. Both the medical admitting resident and the urology resident think the patient should be admitted, but to the other service, right? She can't go home. She needs to be admitted, but she needs to be admitted to the other service. 
My father used to say the quickest way to kill a dog is to sign two different people to feed him. <laughs> That's essentially what's happening here. Right? Is, is both services agree the patient needs to be admitted, but not to, not to my service. So how are you going to resolve this? So let's talk about these three prep questions again. What's the scope of your influence? Do you have influence to get this done? Do you have total control? Certainly not, right? Do you have partial control, but you have a lot of influence? Probably. That's probably where you are, right? What are you negotiating for? What do you want? Want the patient, what, to be admitted to medicine? So what is that? I mean, what are you looking for? Best outcome for the patient, that's true, right? But what do you really want? So what in hard characteristics do you really want? You want the patient to be admitted to medicine? You want them to urology? So you want medicine, okay? With it. And again, I made this hard, I made this case hard, right? This is an infected stone, right? With, with obstructive uh, pathology. So you have a closed face infection. Closed face infection usually equals surgical disease. But putting a patient with rate uncontrolled AFib on a surgical service is not really the best place for that patient. So it's a tough patient. But this certainly happens, right? And usually this happens and you know we fumble through it each individual time. And often in this case we'll end up in the CMO's you know, office because the patient really does have two homes. They have surgical pathology, closed face infection, maybe it can be perked, maybe it can be drained, but also has AFib. And who are you negotiating with? Right? Usually negotiating with a junior medicine resident and a PGY1 urology resident, maybe a PGY2. Can they give you what you want? Maybe, probably not. Maybe they can. These are things to think about. Do they have the power? Right? Because I would not be negotiating with a PGY1 urology resident, right? As as the as the program director as an attending physician. Because they don't have the power. First of all, they don't have the power to deny me, but they certainly don't have the power to really negotiate. So, something to think of. All right, um, another case. So, you're the attending at UHB. 67-year-old um, female presents the emergency department with syncope. <coughs> Excuse me. She denies chest pain, shortness of breath. <coughs> mm. Don't correct me if I go down. <laughs> Labs are normal. There's a history of CHF with low ejection fraction. Right? The symptoms sound vagal. They are of no concern to the resident. Resident uh, wants to send the patient home. You want to tell him um, how to resolve this problem. So, so you're the attending physician, right? We have several attendings here. Mark, do you think this patient gets admitted or goes home? And admitted. Every time, right? The right answer is this patient needs to be admitted, but the resident wants to send the person home. So, what's the scope of influence as the, as the attending physician? Total control. <laughs> it's true. You know, I mean, you don't want to damage the relationship, but the person's not going to go home. <laughs> so, you have total control. Now, there are ways you can exert that control that are more nice, but you have total control. So, with total control, you may not need to negotiate at all. <laughs> what are you negotiating for, and who are you negotiating with? And you may be negotiating with a PGY1 resident that doesn't understand syncope with CHF and low ejection fraction, and 67-year-old is, you know, potentially very, very bad. Could they have a vagal episode? Yeah, they probably may. could. Yeah. Could this be like what happens right before they die? Yes. The way that Jim Quinn, who wrote the San Francisco syncope rule, he says syncope is when people die and then come back. Right? That's real syncope. So, more practice. You're the chief resident of emergency medicine. Rotating EM residents in the SICU have not been given the chance to place many chest tubes over the past several months. The EM resident's procedural experience is declining. You decide to meet with the surgical chief resident in the SICU to resolve this problem. What's your scope of influence? Yeah, it's hard to tell, right? It, it depends. You, you certainly don't have total control. You may have influence. You probably have partial control, low influence. 
you may have no control. Right? You may not figure this out until you actually get there. <laughs> what are you negotiating for? We're gonna make it a drill down on this. What are you negotiating for? What do you want? D'Artagnan, I saw you before. Where are you? You escaped. There you are. What are you negotiating for? Okay, so procedural experience, do you want chest tubes in the sick view? So what you really want is you want procedural experience. That may or may not be required to be in the sick view, right? It may or may not be necessary to do that on live patients, right? But you're looking for procedural experience, and that's what you're negotiating for, is more procedural experience for your residents, right? But, as we're gonna learn about, right, there, there may be other options. Here you're negotiating with, can this person give you what you need? The surgical chief that month in the SICU probably, probably doesn't have the power to really change your fate, right? So they may not be able to negotiate at all. Um, they may think they're able to negotiate, and it may change for the next you know, 16 days until the, until the block is over. But then the new chief comes in, there's a new sheriff in town. So your position, total control, no need to negotiate. This is the attending physician. They get to decide when the patient gets admitted with sanctity. You don't really have to negotiate. Partial control, high influence, actually minimal negotiation is needed. Right? This may be the attending physician uh, trying to admit a patient to uh, the medical service. Right? High influence. Partial control, low influence, maybe a junior resident doing the same thing. And um, no control, no influence, you can't negotiate at all, right? You need to have a surrogate negotiate. So maybe your program director, right? You engage Dr. Smith to have these conversations, or Willis, or Silverberg, or whoever. Well, probably not Silverberg. <laughs> so we'll adjust the case a little bit. So you're the APD of emergency medicine, uh, and uh, you meet with surgical faculty, right? So we're gonna talk the rest of this case, and actually you have um, some influence, right, and some control, so negotiation becomes important. So this is the process, separate the people from the problem. The people are not the issue. The problem is procedural experience. It's not that the surgical, the surgical guys are, are being greedy, right? Maybe they are, but the problem is actually that you want procedural experience for your residents. Focus on interests, not positions. Interests are what you need. Positions is what you sort of, you know, we want to do the chest tubes on our patients. Our position is, I want chest tubes for my patients. So the EM resident takes care of a patient, they get the chest tube. That's, an, that's, 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 a, that's a position. That's a position statement. It's not really what you want. What you want is procedural experience. And then options for mutual gain. We'll talk about that, right? What are some things we can do where both of us can win? And then rely on objective data. So there may be some objective data out there that you can rely on, that everyone can agree on, okay, this is actually what needs to happen. So separate the people from the problem. Negotiators are people, they have interests, they have concerns, they have fears, they have their own wants. Your fears are not necessarily their intentions. Your fear is that you're not gonna get any chest tubes anymore and your residents are gonna graduate the inability to decompress the chest. And that's not really what they're trying to do. Right? They have interests as well. Make proposals consistent with their values. Right? If you say, well, emergency medicine is really strong in this institution, so we want to do all the chest tubes. Right? That's not consistent with their values. So you have to make proposals that are, that are going to be consistent with what they want as well. Don't blame them for your problem. You're the ones that aren't getting the procedural experience. Don't blame them for the problem. You need to find a way that you can solve your problem and you need their help, right? But it's not their fault. Recognize emotions. You're gonna be angry, they're gonna be angry. They have positions, right, that may be or may not be consistent with their interests. So recognize that. As emotions begin to, to, to flare, you wanna recognize that uh, and figure out what they're concerned about. Why are emergency medicine residents not getting the procedures anymore? Like, what, what's the concern? What, what's behind that? When you look at a sort of a, an iceberg, right? The iceberg at the top is the positions, 
The bottom, what's below, which you can't really see, unless you look for it, are the interests behind that, the core concerns. So how do you get there? Actively listen, repeat back what they've said. Acknowledge their interests. I understand that, you're, that you also are interested in procedural experience. I'm hearing you saying that procedural experience is going down because there's not as much trauma anymore in New York City. I understand what you're saying. Speak to be understood, right? So be very clear about what you want and what you need <coughs> and what you can offer. <coughs> and, <coughs> whoo, sorry. Don't react to emotional out, um, <coughs> outbursts, right? So. You know, they, they may, you know, slam their, their feet down and, and, you know, stomp out of the room. And don't respond to the emotional outbursts. Allow them to blow off steam. Next, focus on interests, not problems, or positions, I mean. So just to remind you what our case is. So spend time identifying interests. Sit out. Talk with them. All right, what are the interests? And again, we're doing more of a long-term negotiation here about procedural experience. But you can do this quickly in trying to get the person admitted to medicine. What are the interests? The interests are they want, uh, they want to make sure that the person winds up on medicine, deserves to be on medicine, has medical problems, that they're not going to decompensate and need to go to the ICU. They want to make sure that the person uh, isn't going to wind up on some other service, that they're not going to be a rock they can't get rid of for the next four months. Right? They, they have interests when they admit patients to medicine. Try to identify what those are. Figure out what the core concerns are. Be flexible. Oops, I forgot my last one there. Oh, identify shared interests. So you want the best thing for the patient. You want this person to wind up on uh, the right service, get good care, right? So identify those common interests. And be hard on the problem, soft on the people, right? Don't be nasty to the person, right? It's not their fault, but be hard on the problem. The problem needs to get solved. So, interest and not position. So, what are the interests with this, with this particular thing? I think we spent some time on this. What are your interests, what are their interests, and what are mutual interests? Going back to the, the APD problem, the surgical <coughs> ICU problem. And then options for mutual gain. So, uh, don't assume the pie is fixed, right? So. Yeah, there's only 14 patients per month that get chest tubes, but that's only in the sick view. So what are, what are other options? Are there other patients that get, uh, that get chest tubes? What about going to CT surgery clinic or, or to the ICU for every person where they open the chest or go to the OR or something? There are other options, right? The pie's not fixed. What about high fidelity procedure labs? What about low fidelity procedure labs, right? Get some pork ribs, slap them on the side of a mannequin, right? Practice the chest tube that way. Right? Don't assume that that pie is fixed. Don't search for a single answer. You can brainstorm to figure out what these are and make it easy for them to say yes. Like, if we do this, won't that solve your problem? Yes. So, are there options for mutual gain? We talked a little bit about this. Maybe procedure labs, maybe, you know, the CT surgeons, you know, have a bunch of chest tubes to go in. Like, the CT surgery residents, they get tons of chest tubes, right? So maybe, maybe that's a place where we can sort of investigate for more chest tubes. And insist on using objective criteria. So what criteria are out there? So are there a set number of chest tubes you're supposed to have? I mean, there are objective criteria. Does the ACGME, or more specifically the RRC, define how many chest tubes you're supposed to do? Yeah. There are some, some yeah, there are objective criteria that you can that you can use. Right? So then it's no longer a contest of wills. It's not it's not what I want versus what you want. Both parties can negotiate around these criteria. Sure, you're supposed to get whatever it is, 15 or something chest tubes, I've forgotten the actual number. Um, but they don't all have to be in the sick view. So they're ACGME regs. This person, they need to be admitted. Are there objective criteria who needs to be admitted? The Milman criteria, you guys heard of those? Mm -hmm. The interqual criteria? Those are objective criteria. Can't argue about that. Interqual criteria say this person needs to be admitted. They can be admitted. Maybe not what Program X allows, maybe not what the MAR yesterday did. Well, this person got admitted yesterday. 
Well, it's not necessarily important. Is there a hospital policy? Right? Do people with medical issues get admitted to orthopedics when they have a hip fracture? Or do they get admitted to medicine or orthopedic consults? Or do they get admitted to orthopedics and medicine consults? Right? Usually these things keep popping up, so a, ho a hospital policy gets designed to answer that question. Right? That's an objective criteria. Let's talk a little about positional negotiation, right? This is the other one. This is the win-lose. I have a lot of material here, and again, you'll see this. Uh, I'll make this available after, but um, there's some tips and tricks in here. Now, this is not going to work well in the hospital. This may work well in your personal life. It may work well when you're buying stuff, but there are a couple of, uh, a couple of things with positional negotiation. Again, what's the banta? What's your reservation point? And is the negotiation competitive, collaborative, or is it mixed? And what's your target point? So I'm going to talk about a house transaction that I had in, uh, in Kentucky. Right? This is a typical transaction. There's the seller. The seller has a reservation point, a point which they do not want to go below. The buyer doesn't want to pay much money, but they have a, essentially a reservation point that they don't want to go above. When you put these all together, you have the seller, the buyer, the two reservation points, and in between is this negotiation zone, right? So what you want to do is claim as much of that orange as possible. <clears throat> Try to ascertain what their reservation point is. That will make things go a little quicker. And again, this, this stuff, when I went to the UK leadership uh, forum on, on uh, so UK Healthcare sends some of their up-and-coming people to this leadership forum uh, in the, in the uh, College of Business. Um, so for about eight months, I was taking uh, MBA classes. And, and this lecture changed my life, right, when they talked about negotiation. So open aggressively with the highest defensible offer. It anchors the other party. You now set a number, right? That, you're going to anchor around that number. It also can influence a reservation point. If they think this is going to go for about $200, and you tell them, no, I'm not paying more than 15 bucks for this, they may say, all right, well, maybe not 200 okay, maybe 150 right? So their reservation point can actually move. Make seemingly generous concessions. Most negotiations are going to wind up around the center point, right? You say 100 I say 200 Chances are this is going to go for about a buck fifty, right? Employ a phone pattern to your concessions to signal your target point. This is something that I didn't think a lot about, and I'll talk about what that means, but um, it, it applies pressure to the other party without you having to do that. So is this a funnel pattern? 500, 475, 450, 425. What's the next offer? 400. This is a funnel pattern, right? 500, 475, 465, 460. I, I'm now, when I'm making this offer, right, you now see that I'm getting close to my reservation point, or at least I'm signaling that, right? So it's applying pressure to you, but I'm not actually applying pressure, right? Because what I want to do is apply pressure, but appear like I'm not applying pressure. <laughs> <coughs> Try to get the other party to negotiate among, against themselves rather than through reciprocal concessions. I'll show you an example of that, brilliant. Because um, you want to complain, you want to get as much of the negotiating zone as possible. So, again, these are the things you need to think about. What's the target point? So I'm talking about selling a house, right? My banter. Uh, I'll just rent, right? I don't have to sell a house. Or with that house, maybe I'll just rent the house, right? What's the reservation point? What's the target point? How much money do I want to make on this sale of this house? Right? Comps around this area sell between 200 and 225 for a three-bedroom house there. Um, what's the target point? My target point is about 225. That's about what I wanted to be. I talked to a realtor. They say, yeah, the house can go for about 225. I can see that happening. That's consistent. So this is me. There's my target point, my reservation point. So this is how things went. Right? This is the actual negotiation. So my first offer was for uh, 245, right? I, I went a little high. I, I, my target point was was 225 and I wanted to be at 270 or I offered 245 right open with a defensible offer that's the biggest one and they said 
uh, we'll give you 200. Right, so their initial offer was 200. So now we have a negotiation zone between 245 and 200. It's not going to go for above asking, right? And they're not going to decrease their offer, right? So that's the negotiation zone. So I said, all right, I really want to work with you. I'll, we'll sell it for 230. And they said, 208. So I said, I am hurt. I am hurt. <laughs> I made a huge concession, and you didn't do anything. I mean, I gave 15 and you gave eight. You're taking advantage of little old me. And they said, okay, 215. So what, what they did was they negotiated against themselves. I didn't make another offer. They negotiated against themselves. So they went from 200 to, to, uh, to 215, right? And I didn't have to make any reciprocal offer. Right? So I brought the number up without making a reciprocal offer. So I then said, well, 227, not I'm not willing to go any lower, right? So I've employed a funnel pattern. I'm signaling I have a reservation point, and they don't have a funnel. Like, they have no, no real movement. Like, I, I don't understand why they picked these numbers. Um, so they said, best and final offer. So now I've said 227. They said 223, and both of us have signaled we have a reservation point. So I said, okay, fine. I'll meet you in the middle, right? But only if the realtors agree to a 5% commission instead of the 6% commission that's standard. Now that saves me 2,200 bucks. Doesn't have any effect on the seller or the buyer, so they said, okay, right? We'll get, we'll get our realtor to agree to that because the realtor's not gonna suffer a lot of uh, loss in there. And but the other thing I said, all right, and, and no repairs upon inspection. You inspect it and you can say, no, I don't wanna buy the house if something's terrible about it. Uh, or you can, or you can buy the house, but you're not going to nickel and dime. You have to make a decision, 225, and then make a decision, yes or no, based on the, the report of the inspection. And I want this closed by the end of the month. I got a big trip to Haiti planned. You know, I want some money in my pocket. So what happened? It was a deal at 225. The house went as is. The deal closed by the end of the month. So I schooled this person, right? Because <laughs> you remember, you, you remember what my what my uh, what my reservation point was? 200, right? What was my target? 225, that's what I wanted. So, 225 minus 5% commission, I clear 213 from the sale. I saved two, uh, 2,200 bucks with that 1% change on the commission. Now the two sides split a 2.5% commission instead of a 3 commission, they don't split it, they each have 2.5. So the effective sale price is actually 230. If I was paying a 6% a sale uh, commission, this would have been the sale price, right? So above my target, um, and it went $30,000 over reservation, right? So that's how positioning works. Now, this person, we're not friends anymore, right? The seller. So it's okay to have positional bargaining with something you don't want to have a relationship with after that. Let's talk for a few seconds. We're winding up the end of the lecture. These are some tactics that you need to look out for when you're doing positional bar bargaining. Right, this is the hard ball. So low ball, high ball. You know what these are. Somebody low ball is an offer. They give an offer that's clearly not defensive. Or an offer that clearly not defensive on the other end. It's a high ball offer. They can't defend it. You say, how did you come up with that number? They say, that's what I think it's worth. But there's no, there's no real you know, evidence behind that. Right? It's just a low ball offer. Good cop, bad cop. When do they do this? Car sales, right? So you went to good. I really want to work with you. I don't. Know, I got to talk to my manager. I, that's ooh, that's a lot of money. I don't know. I got to talk to the manager. They're gone. They're back. They're drinking coffee, and jelly beans. They come back 15 minutes later after you're sweating in their office, and they say, ah, my manager says we can go. You know, whatever, twenty-two thousand. <coughs> this is good cop, bad cop. You're not able to see the bad cop, right? But it's good in the, in the sales business. Man, I really want. To I want to put you in this new vehicle. I really do. I got out. I got to talk to my manager. Right. So the bad cop's not there. A bogey. A bogey is when they pretend something's very important, but it's not really important. So when I was buying my house that I lived in in Kentucky, I bogeyed the person. Right. About radon. So there was a rate. There was a high radon level in the house. And I said, My God, now that I got a wife and child, I can't. I can't bring my my family into this cancer-causing house. Like you need, I mean, geez, you gotta lower that price. Like that, 
And when you're trying to kill my own poor baby. <laughs> Truthfully, I can get a radon remediation system put in for like, you know, I don't know, three grand, right? But no, I got like 30,000 off the house because of that. <laughs> Intimidation, right? And I know Mark Silverberg's done this. Have you ever gone to one of these um, uh, timeshare sales, right? Where they say, oh, we're going to give you a free ski do. We're going to buy you breakfast. You're going to come in. You're only going to be here for 90 minutes, right? So then you're sitting there, and you don't want to buy the timeshare. You just wanted the free ski do, like, you know, and you wanted the breakfast. And, and then they use this guilt or authority. Oh, you know, I only get two appointments a day. And if you had no intention of buying this timeshare, I don't know why you even came in here. They guilt you into it, right? They're throwing emotion into the mix, and you begin to make decisions that aren't your best thing. Mm -hmm. Snow jobs. Snow jobs when they throw all these numbers at you. You know, it's sort of the remediation system. I gave a little bit of a snow job with them. They throw these numbers. You know, they're confusing you. They're, they're taking you off your game with all these technical things, right, where, you're, where you begin to make mistakes. Assume the close, right? This is where they say, all right, so we're going to sell this for 22000 and start filling out the paperwork. <laughs> they slide it in front of you, 22000 You're like, well, we haven't come up with a number yet. They say, just put inside 20. It's all, it's all set. Everything's done. We're already done the numbers. It's all set. And you're like, all right. You sign. Done. You negotiated nothing, <laughs> right? So that's assuming the close. And exploding offers, you see this all the time. It's like, all right, okay. Well, you got you to do it now because I got somebody behind me, you know. Or if you can't do this, if you can't close by tomorrow, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Like this, this, this new rate goes away, right? So the, the offer explodes at a certain point. It puts a time pressure on you that you can't, uh, you know, you can't overcome that time pressure. So you begin to make mistakes, right? So these are very common uh, sort of hardball tactics. I go through them separately. So here's how I deal with it. I ignore it. Right? Where somebody does the exploding offer and I do this. <laughs> Long, agonizing silence. Right? If you're ever one of my residents, you know this. Right? No. I do this. Agonizing silence. I call them out. I say, well, don't bring your exploding offers to me. All right? I'm uncomfortable with you using them. Right? I think that's a hardball tactic, and I don't like it. Right, put it right back on. I name the tactic. I discuss the discomfort. And I say, you know, if you really want to get this done, you know, maybe we should use, you know, a collaborative style, and we can get this negotiation done. We can both be happy. Maybe there's some objective criteria. Why don't you pull out the manufacturer's invoice for this? And they say, well, the MSRP. I say, no, 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 I didn't ask for the MSRP. I asked for the man. I asked for your invoice on it. How much did you pay for it? And they'll figure out how much you're going to clear on it. I want you to make money. I understand. It's Right, so call people out on it. Responding kind, right? If things get out of hand when you're responding kind, where they give you this and then you say, all right, well, I have an exploding offer too. If I can't close by end of day today, five o'clock, I'm gonna be out of town. I'm gonna be out of town for like five months. So if you can't sell me the car today, you're not gonna sell me the car, right? So these, you can return in kind, right? But then things get out of hand, it gets very aggressive. And then you can just cultivate your, your banter. Right? You already know what your banter is. Your best alternative is that you're gonna, you know, bike to work with this car sale. Or you're gonna you're gonna you know use grandma's old jalopy for a couple of months until you can build up some money. Whatever. Alright, so let's go ahead and close this out. So learning points. What's your scope of influence, who you're negotiating for, and who you're negotiating with. Think about this every time you start a negotiation with somebody, whether it's getting a patient admitted, buying a house, whether you're going to be in at five o'clock versus six o'clock, you know, or, or that's old man time. So uh, 12 o'clock versus one in the morning. Separate the kid from the problem. Focus on interests. What are their interests? What are your interests? Are there shared interests? Are there some options for mutual gain? Think outside the box. And then, uh, if there are objective criteria, know those. Do some research before you start. Right? Know that a person, you know, with rate uncontrolled AFib, they're going to be admitted. Or, uh, if they're not going to be admitted, you're going to have the ability to, you know, party birth them and, and, and get them out, or whatever. <coughs> My contact information. Do they have
have any questions. All right, thanks for your time.